apologize because when I walked up here half an hour ago, I had no idea I was going to be giving a presentation. <laughs> um, fortunately, I gave this presentation last week. But I gave it to a room full of university students, so as long as you guys don't check Facebook much, <laughs> it'll be really good. All right, so um, I was teaching for, uh, my friend John teaches the games course in the Digital Cultures program, which is uh, where I have an honorary associateship. And so they teach sort of all of the theory and the culture of games. Can we go to the first slide? And he brought me in because they were talking about virtual reality, and they actually have a group project to do around virtual reality in which they get to sort of think about virtual reality. Yeah. And I wanted to sort of show them some of the antecedents. Now you all know who Nicholas Negroponte is, right? Being digital, found, well, person who funded Wired Magazine to start with, founded something called the Media Lab that you may have heard of. <laughs> all right. So when Negroponte first arrived at MIT, which is where I went to school back in the uh, 70s, he started thinking about ways to make the computer a more conformant experience to the human being. By the time I got to MIT, which is 1980, can you go to the next slide, what he'd come up with was what we called the architecture machine. And this is a, an actual real-time display of a virtual cityscape that had been designed using the architecture machine. And it was 3D, you can see it's not solid, it's just vector, but you, you could actually move around it, you could, you could look around it, you could manipulate the, uh, the landscape. Now this is 1980. There were simulator systems out there that had been demonstrated before this. And there were some very high-end military systems that were in use, but that was pretty much it. This was my first exposure, because I was a freshman, so first year of, of university, and I had friends who were doing research on this, and just hearing about what they were doing completely blew my mind. And it became an obsession for the next 20 years of my life. All right, let's go to the next slide. So, we're gonna talk about first generation virtual reality and why first generation virtual reality maybe didn't go quite as well as everyone back then, myself included, thought it was going to. And I'm calling this part of the talk Barphogenesis because this is about things that make you puke. Next slide, please. All right, so Scott Fisher, one of the gods of virtual reality, who now runs the program in new media at USC Cinema School that I started back in 1988. He is a fu uh, fundamental pioneer. So at NASA Ames Research Laboratory, what they did was they invented a system that was going to be used by astronauts on the space shuttle so they could rehearse extravehicular missions before they actually zoned the spaceship to fix the space shuttle. And so they had a, the first version of a head-mounted display you see on him, and then they had these things they called data gloves on his hands so he could ma ma manipulate objects in the virtual world. This is 1985. Now this became, as it spread out, as Jaron Lanier came out and did VPL and started to tour around and show people this, this now entered consciousness as an idea, and you start to actually see how it's popping up in various media, you know, sort of science fiction-y stuff, but not that science fiction-y. And this is also now the rise of the first generation video game platforms. So the platform wars are Nintendo versus Sega. This is the 1980s to early 90s. Platform wars are Nintendo versus Sega. Can you go to the next slide, please? And so Nintendo creates something they call the Power Glove. This is in 1989, 1990-ish, it's released. It's plastic, you fit it over your arm, it has a sensor array on here that is oriented to the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's very much like the same band we have on a Wii, so that the Nintendo Wii it has the same technology behind it. And of course, it's got all the console buttons on it. Came out, people went, oh my god, this is fantastic. Sold like hotcakes. Next slide, please. There's a problem. I would now like all of you to use the power glove by doing the following. Please leave your arm in that position for the next three minutes. Can someone count the time on this if I'm going to continue to go on? Just thank you. Now, seriously, when I did this with the class, there was actually four guys who actually managed to make it all three minutes, all right? So, this creates the condition that is known in the industry as gorilla arm. 
because your muscles are not designed to be used in this way. You are not designed to hold your arm like this at, for your, from any distance of your body for any period of time. Your musculature is not set up for this. It is not comfortable. And yet this became a fundamental design element. This is a fundamental user interface element of how you use the power glove. And so you have to wonder if anyone in Nintendo, when they were going through the entire design process on this, gave a thought to the fact that kids would have to use this by pointing at a television parents to buy a power glove, and then they tried to use it, and it sucked. It was impossible to use, and it went away. And so you have this idea that it's possible to design an interface for the body in which you have completely ignored the presence of the body. You will be coming back to this. Next slide, please. One minute, 20. <laughs> Harry, one minute. No. And one minute. I found this wonderful quote from Rimbaud, you know, about the long, intimidating, intense, and rational derangement of the senses. The sufferings are enormous. <laughs> One must be strong and born a poet. And this is kind of the mindset that is, has got to be guiding someone who is walking this line between engineering and biology. Right? Because they're, they're basically building devices that torture people. What, what else can you say? And, and yet, do we get out of love? Not because we want to torture people. This is not an S&M device. This is a toy. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> now, I was one of the principal designers in the first <laughs> consumer head-mounted display called the Sega Virtual Viola. This device was an accessory that was meant to be uh, plugged into what in Australia was called the Sega Master System. In America was called the Sega Genesis. Plugged right into the back, and you'd have a virtual world and you'd be able to play it. And we worked terrifically hard. Part of the reason I was involved was because I had invented uh, an orientation sensor that was two orders of magnitude cheaper than any other way of doing it. Have we reached three minutes yet? Uh, 2.49. Wow, you guys are seriously like right? cool. <laughs> And so I was brought in by Sega to participate on the design. And it was a lot of fun because they were very good. <laughs> You've done very well. Now imagine doing that even longer because you're playing some game and you're fighting a boss level on a you know, it's just, it's <laughs> Anyway. So Sega wants to fight back against the power glove. And it comes up with the virtual VR. And it was shown privately at the 1994 CES. Now this is before E3 emerged off of CES and they became separate events. So at this point, about 40% of CES, which is one of the largest trade shows in the world, is a whole of video gaming. Sega and Nintendo have the largest pavilion and nestled deep inside the Sega pavilion is a private viewing lounge where we have a prototype version of this which we are showing to folks from Target and Kmart and Sears and they're all losing their minds and putting these huge orders in because this is clearly going to be the big toy for the summer, uh, for the Christmas of 1994. And it even goes on to get announced as Popular Science's device of the year, innovation of the year. Now, What's interesting is that I think someone showed this to the filmmaker Spike Lee, and Spike Lee managed to grab the prototype of this and pop it into a film that he was making called Clockers, and we'll see a scene from that film when we go to the next slide. Oh, wait a second. Uh, hold on, I'm not good. So that's pretty much what we expected the experience was going to be. Very 
very impressionistic spike oh. down which we have. So that's pretty much what Sega thought would be going on with it. Maybe not the content, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, everything was primed very much in the summer of 94 for a big release. Now, what I remember of what happened next is poorly documented anywhere, so let's just say that this is part of the mythology. But what I remember was that Sega got their first production units off the production line and sent them out for testing to find out whether they were going to need all the electrical standards, blah, 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 blah. And uh, apparently sent them out to some degree of testing around users and how they were affecting users because virtual reality headset has the capacity to affect a person's uh, physiology. And Sega's lawyers came back and said, there is no universe in which you will get an insurance policy for this device to be used by children. Could you go to the next slide, please? And the project was essentially quietly killed. Now, Sega says they claimed the virtual reality effect was too realistic. Now, you can imagine with 320 by 240 displays that maybe realism was not exactly the top. Uh, people might move while wearing the headset and might injure themselves, or maybe process power, or whatever, or artificial, it may be affecting them in certain ways. Um, Next slide, please. So that was the end of that. Sega had poured tens of millions of dollars in three years of research into their project. And they pulled it back, and it went away. And that was pretty much it for consumer VR until Oculus came out in 2012. And it's really all because of this very simple statement. You can't ignore the body in VR because the body is the point of virtual reality. It is the object. It is the thing that everything is in relation to. It is a game that you are playing with the body, with the senses directly. And yet, as you can see from these two examples, this is the first thing that gets left on the cutting room floor. And so there's a very important lesson there because this mistake is now being repeated. Next slide, please. All right, y'all know that Sunday was the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. Did you all see that anywhere? Do you all know what Moore's Law is? <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna be schooling you now. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's 15 years where there's essentially what we would think of as no forward work in virtual reality. And I'm going to be careful because I'm going to qualify that. But there's no forward work. There were a whole bunch of virtual reality startups. I had one. They all collapsed because the market disappeared. I had hitched my wagon to Sega's star. If the virtual VR was a big thing, I would be a very rich man now. It didn't happen. And that was happened. All the first generation of virtual reality companies went away. But the ideas and the techniques started to become profoundly influential. Next slide, please. Because in the first year of that soft Xbox, but you start from this point, from 1995, as soon as VR dies, it pops up and becomes known as video games. Next, originally, all right? There's Lara Croft in 1996. That's Lara Croft in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell that she needs a show. One of my very best friends who had been working in virtual reality even longer than I had said in the 90s, I said, Mark, rendering happens. This was always going to happen. And so these are, again, on $300 pieces of equipment. So that's $300 getting you a render in 1996, and that's $300 getting you a render in 2012. Why? Because of Moore's Law. Next slide, please. All right. April the 19th, 1965, a paper was published by a guy named Gordon Moore. He co-founded a company you might have heard of called Intel. It's still alive. And this is one of the charts from it. He said that every 24 months, the cost to make a transistor drops in half. Every 24 months. 
we had enough experience building transistors by 1965 that he could see this. And he said in 1970, 1975, so on and so on and so forth. So this became known as Moore's Law. All right? So 50 years ago this week, and we have not departed from that. So that means there's 25 two-year periods. In other words, the cost to fabricate a transistor is 1 over 2 to the 25th of the cost to fabricate a transistor when he wrote this paper in 1965, which I think, if I remember, it was around 100 million. So a single transistor is 100 million times cheaper than it was in 1965. This is Moore's Law. This is why computers get bigger and faster and cheaper. That's why my iPhone 6 has more computing power. Yeah. So all of IBM's entire production line in 1965 had less power than my iPhone 6. And the same thing happened to computer graphics. So when you put more power behind computer graphics, the graphics get bigger, they get faster, so on and so on and so on. Next slide, please. Now, I read this stat last week. More transistors were manufactured last year than had been manufactured in every single year in all of human history prior to 2011. All right. That's the way things are going now. It's just a lot of transistors. Next slide, please. Oh, that's right. Uh, have you, it would be nice to show this, but when I'm not on Wi-Fi and I'm not going to show it. You should all take a look at it later if you haven't seen this. Okay. So, what happens is, you have the, the empty quarter, 95 to 20, 2010. By the end, computers are so much faster, browsers are so much faster, computer displays, computer graphics are so much faster, that it now starts to become possible to do some things inside of a browser that had not even been conceivable from before. Now, uh, I, 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 in some ways, I've completely downplayed my own history. As soon as the Sega project bombed, I went off and created the first 3D interface to the World Wide Web, something called VRML, which became an international standard and part of MPEG-4. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So this entire field of 3D on the web, I invented. Um, but in 1995, the kinds of things that you could do with it, because computers were relatively slow back then, versus 2011, the capacities were much, much greater. There was a new language developed called WebGL, which is essentially a set of JavaScript interfaces and JavaScript libraries that allow you to do very sophisticated 3D virtual <coughs> world work inside of a web browser. And one of the very first pieces that demonstrated this is a wonderful music video called Three Dreams of Black. www.ro.me is, is the URL. And it was the first time that people really realized that the browser now is a good platform for virtual reality in the 21st century. We did a lot of interesting stuff in the 20th century, but things weren't quite there. And they required plugins. And actually, it turns out getting people to download and install a plugin, unless it's Flash, is almost an insurmountable obstacle. OK, so you have WebGL coming. It's the first modern technology that starts to leverage the incredible transformation. <coughs> Next slide, please. And of course, the next year you start to get the Oculus Rift. So now you start to get a display system that can be plugged into a computer that has a really fast chip in it, that has really fast graphics in it, and you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Now, the Oculus itself is really, it's a head-mounted display, so it has the displays in it. It doesn't have any native intelligence inside of it. It has to be driven by a computer that it's slave to. Next slide, please. Now, to give you an idea of the differences here, I'm going to show you a little segment of Osmos in a couple of minutes. This is John Harrison, who was the engineer who worked with artist Shar Davies to create probably, arguably, the first real piece of fully immersive virtual art called Osmos. And there's a lovely video on YouTube that I'll show you just a minute of, but I encourage you to look at. And here he is sitting in his development studio working with it. And he's got a three quarters of a million dollar silk and graphics computer that's being used for the rendering, plus all this other gear for his development. And that's less powerful than an iPhone 6, all told. All right, so that shows you the degree of the transition here. And so what you're talking about now is the kinds of things that were 
hard to do and expensive to do and Shaw's biggest disappointment with Osmos was that it was installed at a museum and only one person at a time could go into it because it's a really nice piece and now she can actually create something and deploy it and she is secretly working she gives me hints every once in a while but she's secretly working on something that's going to be available to lots and lots of people because the technology has now become pervasive. Next slide please. Now, have you all seen the cardboard? We have it. I prop one along because there's, there's nothing like props. Okay, that is actually the cardboard version of the cardboard. It was released at Google's developer conference in June last year, and it caught on like a house fire, because what it does is it leverages the native capacity of your smartphone as this incredible rendering engine to be able to do virtual reality. And I'm gonna put, I have a cute little piece of virtual reality that I'll just spark up and I'll, I'll pass this around so you can all have some fun with it. Uh, there it is, it's a roller coaster, which you know is cheap, but it's, it's a cheap throw, but it's, there are worse things in the world than a cheap throw. Anyway, the idea with the Google Cardboard was it's possible to take a smartphone, right? Write a program that divides the display into two stereo images, connect them with some cheap optics in a literal cardboard head-mounted display, all right? If you go on Alibaba or eBay, you can buy these in quantity from China for $3. <laughs> All right, I bought that single unit on eBay from an Australian vendor, and that's plastic because my cardboard one, and that cost $25. And I probably got slightly ripped off, but I didn't want to wait for something to come from Hong Kong. What this is telling us is that all of this fancy shit that Oculus wants you to believe is what virtual reality is, is bullshit, it's marketing. In fact, your smartphone, the thing that you're carrying around with you, and the thing that will only get better at this, is in fact a fine platform for virtual reality. Next slide, please. Someone should have told Zuckerberg before he's been to Google. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the thing. All right, so now that we can do whatever we want, now that the technology of virtual reality has been democratized, and this has been a very big thing for me, because the work that I did in VRML, in virtual reality on the web, was always designed to be used by anyone. I didn't want VR to be something that was only kept in the lab or only required very expensive pieces of equipment. So we designed VRML to be used on normal PCs by normal people, and that opened the door. Now we're actually in an era where everything is cheap enough that everyone can start walking through that door. So all of that stuff that I talked about at the beginning about the body and the problems the body is presenting, Let's come back to that. Next slide, please. All right, so this is Osmos. Remember you saw John Harrison with his three quarters of a million dollars worth of equipment. Char Davies designed this work in 95. She had just learned how to scuba dive. And she said, okay, if I want people to have a really deep experience of the virtual world that actually feels comfortable with their body, I'm gonna build an apparatus that they can put around their body and just as if I were a scuba diver, you will be able to navigate through that world by controlling the volume of air in your lungs, because that changes the buoyancy of your body. So if you want to go up in this virtual world, you expand your chest, you want to go down, and then you can lean around, and you move through the world this way. She didn't get a whole lot of simulator sickness. Why? Because the coupling relationship that makes it much easier for people to be in the virtual world. So, it's still a stellar piece of work. 20 years on, it still has set a standard for how you can treat the body as a friendly object, how you can bring it in and make it part of your work. So, that whole video, if you type Osmos into YouTube, it'll come up in 16 minutes, you should really watch it. And that's what a head mount, that's how big a head mount display was back in the day, you can tell. 
It's like something on a video. And this is her talking about sort of pointing to her experience as a scuba diver. And she was not just a scuba diver, she learned how to deep dive. She was going down to 100 meters where she started to have rapture of the deep. And part of that actually informed her artwork. We had that back in the old days, and then all of a sudden, basically out of nowhere, Microsoft comes up with some technology. They bought from some Israelis, doesn't matter, it's a good buy, all right? That is essentially insane. The Kinect, have you all played with the Kinect? Do you know how a Kinect works? It literally scans the room with infrared and then reads the reflection, so that what you get is a depth map the computer understands in three dimensions how far everything is from its camera. So it is actually seeing the room not as a flat image, which you would get with a normal camera, but you're getting it with depth. And that's the Connect 1, which actually compared to the Connect 2 is shite technology. Connect 2 is actually literally measuring the time it takes a photon to bounce off of you. It is measuring, as they call it, <coughs> time of travel, the speed of light. You can't do better than that. So the Connect 2 is now this thing, and, you know, and that's bundled with the platform. But now what you have is this reversal. Rather than saying that we're going to make the person strap themselves into the computer, you flip that idea and you turn it inside out. You say, we're going to make the computer watch the person. And we're going to give the computer the tools that it needs so that there's no separation in the space. The computer is essentially observed in the space. All right, next slide, please. Now, my mate John Tonkin, who I was teaching for, is an artist and did use the Connect in conjunction with some of his artworks. And uh, so this is a these are artworks, experiment in proximity. As you get closer to the screen, we start to surf it. So he, he's basically sort of swimming through sort of unconsciousness, semi-consciousness, and then as you get closer, you pop up into these different views. And one of them, he's on a dance floor. Another one, he's reading a book. Another one, he's, I think, in the shopping market, whatever it is, right there, he's reading a book. And the idea is that you can use the prox, you can use proximity and your body in space as a way of being interacting with the world. All right, next slide, please. Okay, Leap Motion, have you all seen the Leap Motion? Which is this device that kind of was supposed to have replaced the mouse. They're now using it with the Oculus because it didn't replace the mouse. And you know why it didn't replace the mouse? Look in the video. But when you do it, the effect is actually quite different. This is one reason. All right, it's just more of this. this is the next slide, please. But you can see no lies about that. And that's a reason to still use mechanical keyboards. It's because the body has needs. And if you don't meet the needs of the body, you make the brain fill in the gap. And the brain's going to get tired. And the brain's not going to like that. And yet, this is a design thing. We have designed an entire universe of glass surfaces that we are now typing on and going. <laughs> I have in fact. That's purely, that's not a thing. But it is, that's the thing. I mean, it's it not is. In, it, not in that traditional sense. Not in that traditional sense. At least that technology can't be used last. Yes. Yeah. We get our brain thinking. Well, well and, and the thought is that that technology will be on the screen of the 6S or the 7, right? That's the size of this reason. Yeah. So, so, but at this point, we're just typing on completely non responsive lives, right? So, yeah. All right. Um, so, so we're, we're in this really interesting space now where we know how to do things that work but are wrong, and we know how to do things that are right but aren't virtual enough to actually get the job that we want done done. This is kind of where we are. Next slide, please. All right. So where are we going? Next slide. 
So augmented reality has been a thing for a very long time. I actually went and flew up to Seattle and consulted with Boeing back in 93 or 94 about augmented reality because they were building the 777 that was entering production at that time. The 777 at that time was the most complicated mechanical thing that had ever been made and they wanted to be able to have people both assembling and working on it, wearing a display that would show them while they were on the aircraft what the component was, how to work on it. So it would actually be overlaid on top of what they were doing. And for Boeing to do this, they didn't just have to have display technology, they had to have incredibly accurate sensor technology so that they would know precisely where you were looking and what was there. And Boeing has this, and they worked very hard on it because they knew it was going to be important. They have it to some degree. Next slide. Of course, the way most people would think of this is Google Glass. Now, how many of you have tried Glass? And what did you think? Um, I found it jarring. Did you find it hard to integrate that data with the rest of your experience? I found it hard to focus on two things at once. And again, we're not robots. We want our attention to be much more integral, right? We want it to. We don't want the data display just sort of boring its way into our mind over here. We want to be able to think about it. Google Glass was an experiment. The experiment has not, at this time, succeeded. Okay, fair enough, that's all right. That doesn't mean we're done here. Um, but it is pointing toward a kind of experience that at least Google wants us to have. And people got excited about it. Next slide, please. Now, the thing that I'm excited by, the first piece of VR tech that in 20 years has excited me is this, the Microsoft HoloLens. So the Microsoft HoloLens is an augmented reality display that essentially takes Microsoft's strength with the Kinect and applies it to a heads-up display so that you can now look out into an environment and it will register the environment into the virtual world. So, of course, one of the demos they showed was essentially someone playing Minecraft on top of a tabletop surface which is the kind of thing that's possible. Now, this is a very sophisticated device. Microsoft will probably, at the end of the, at the, end of the month at their Build Dev Conference, announce when it will be available, but they might not. It's very exciting. It's a very good direction for Microsoft to be going in. But all reports are, yes, it's amazing, and it still kind of sucks. Not because it's bad, but everyone wants higher resolution, this and that and the other thing. So this is, to me, the way we're going to see most people interacting with most virtual worlds most of the time, which is that it's going to be mixed. And we're going to be using this to bring in the virtual world into the real world, but we're probably going to mostly remain grounded in the real world. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be moments like the roller coaster app that we're all playing with that you'll have fun with. But I think that this is going to be more toward the way things are going. Next slide, please. All right. Did you all see this video? This is Magic Leap, which is also doing its own heads-up display and the view from inside. But take a look at the office of the future. Eh, whatever. Right. 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 Gmail. Oh, I think, you know, I'm at the office. I should probably play a game, because you always do that. That's <laughs> right. So they were supposed to actually present the device at TED this year. They didn't. They sent this video instead. This video was produced by Weta, which means, guess what? It's smoke. All right. This is what they want their device to be able to do. Google has poured a half a billion dollars into the company. That's special. No, I know, but is it theoretically it's a projection? It's a projection. Theoretically, it's a retinal scanning projection, which was a very exciting technology from 20 years ago that's been made a way back. So it's literally drawing raster onto your retina, theoretically. Sounds dangerous. Yeah, that's what I've always thought. In what universe is an insurance company going to come? Next slide. Next slide, please. 
Well, now I, I want to start to turn this in a slightly different direction to sort of close with where I actually think things are most interesting right now. It's a very influential artwork from 1980 called A Hole in Space. A Hole in Space took two two-way video screens, which in 1980, what do you mean two-way video screens? Large monitors with cameras attached to them. One was set up in Century City in Los Angeles, one was set up in Lincoln City, uh, Lincoln Center in New York, and they were just completely open, and anyone could come up to them and do whatever they wanted to do. And it became this whole emergent community. People would make dates to come and talk by the screens. You know, people who knew people in one city or the other, or people would have conversations, and it just became a whole thing. There's video of this, there's in fact a lot of video of this stuff online, because this is a seminal artwork in presence. And it was the first time that people started to see what was really kind of going to be possible. Because at this point, the only way you could have done this before was with live television, right? Someone would be bouncing something off of a satellite. But this is the first time this is, in a sense, broadly democratically accessible. Next slide. All right, have you all played with YouTube 360 yet? Now, it doesn't work on iOS devices yet. It works on Android devices. It also works inside of Chrome on the desktop. But uh, you can shoot a 360 panoramic video, so that's basically spherical, so you can look around in every axis. And if you play it inside the YouTube app on Android, you can literally look around, all right, while the video is playing in real time. Now, the next place that's going to go is inside of the head mounted display, right, because that's clear. Because once you have that, uh, and I would, I'm surprised that there isn't a cardboard app that Google's done for that yet. I think it's probably in process. But that's sort of like the next place to go is you put it in cardboard and then you put it in an Oculus. And now you have this idea of fully immersive video. And of course, we're hearing about Spielberg making uh, Ready Player One inside of virtual reality and these other films coming up. And you'll see what happens with that. The production costs in virtual worlds will be incredibly high. Right? They're not going to be cheap to make these films. But we'll see what happens. But YouTube is now sort of putting its foot out and saying, look, this is the next place the video is going. So we're going to this idea of fully immersive video. All right, next slide, please. So when I was at the launch conference in San Francisco in February, I get to evaluate, I'm the judge there, so I have to evaluate not just the startups that are pitching on stage, but all these startups that are in the demo pit, so it was like 200 of them. And one of the ones that I saw and really liked was a company called Video Stitch. And what they will do is they can take an arbitrary number of cameras, and they basically had this tripod that had six different uh, GoPros mounted on it, pointing in all the different directions, and the software will automatically stitch those together into this 360 panoramic image. So they can take any number of cameras, and you can take any quality of cameras. They can do this with red cameras, they can do this with GoPros, they can do this, they told me, quietly, with smartphones. So you now have this capacity to do this, and this is, by the way, a real-time tool. So I had the extremely disturbing experience that I do not wish on any of you of putting a head-mounted display on and seeing what I looked from the back. And it's, it's not like looking through mirrors. It's just disturbing. All right, because your, your point of view is over there. And you're like, all right. But this is now, this runs on a normal PC, and this is now real time. So we're not talking, you know, the YouTube 360 videos are pre-recorded. We're now talking about, okay, real time. They've just closed a deal with Facebook Oculus to do some work as well. Next slide, please. Is this a Meerkat shop or is this a Periscope shop? <laughs> Bit about, glad to hear it. So of course, in the last 45 days, we have the live broadcasting apps, Meerkat and Periscope. And so now, every person with a mobile can now reach an audience of everyone on the planet. That immediately wrecked a few things, such as being able to show anything privately, because as long as there's one person broadcasting, it's no longer private. But you also now have this idea that everyone is carrying around something inside of their pocket that allows them to start broadcasting. Now, this is broadcasting a window. The only difference between that window and something that's 360 immersive is a lens. 
So where VC is going, the next 18 months maybe, as the pieces fall into place, live broadcasting is going to make a transition. Now, the thing that I've learned from 35 years in technology is that transitions are never zero to one, despite what Peter Thiel might say. Transitions take time. But in 18 months, the idea of being able to see a live cross to a football game, or to a war zone, or to a rally that is 360 immersive in high, very high definition, that's not going to be foreign because all of the pieces are already in place. Next slide, please. So, to me, it's not pre-recorded, it's live. The future isn't virtual, it's real. It is immersive. And I hope you understand now that that future is already here. Thank you.